Industry players say renewable energy sources could account for 10% of Singapore's energy mix in 2020. Now that's more than double the current contribution. This was outlined in a white paper released two days ago by the Sustainable Energy Association of Singapore. And to hasten the adoption of renewables, they say Singapore should narrow its focus to sectors with the highest potential. These include biomass, biogas and most importantly, solar. But the Energy Market Authority says while it supports the use of solar energy, the pace of its adoption will depend on factors like the evolution of technology, installation costs and the amount of space available. In this week's Spotlight, Melissa Chong explores Singapore's energy future in 2020 and beyond. Singapore's population is just 5.3 million, but it's a nation of energy guzzlers. People in the country consumed 124 kilograms of oil per $1,000 of GDP, about the same as Japan, but higher than Hong Kong and the United Kingdom. So where does all that energy come from? Let's assume this glass represents Singapore's total electricity needs. About 84% comes from natural gas, another 12% from petroleum products. And the remainder, just under 5%, comes from renewable sources. Of the total amount, most is used by industry, about a third for the commercial sector, and the rest for households and transport. And in May this year, Singapore opened its first liquefied natural gas, or LNG, terminal to secure our supply of natural gas from places as far away as the Middle East and the US. Singapore also plans to award new import licenses to supply the next tranche of LNG imports. These developments signal the government's intention to place its bets on natural gas, at least in the short to medium term. Definitely moving to LNG gives us that flexibility now that we could actually tap onto very far away resources of natural gas that we could bring in. Um, as to whether it's going to be completely sustainable, that's, that the answer is no. I think nobody knows exactly the time when oil and gas will run out, probably 50 years from now. So while natural gas holds much promise for now, alternatives are still needed. In sunny Singapore, located right above the equator, solar energy seems like the obvious solution. We're on the equator, so we do get good sunshine. Electricity prices are likely to rise long term due to the rise in fossil fuel prices. And the cost of solar panels has come down rapidly in the last few years and will continue to decline slowly. The cost of installing solar panels has been falling steadily over the past few years. In 2007, it cost $12 per watt of energy generated. Today, the price is just $3. And as technology continues to improve, researchers say that prices could continue to fall. But over the past few years, the number of solar panels installed has been dismal. But researchers say that the figures could jump as more building owners recognize the potential of solar. And to demonstrate its potential, Mr. England has installed his own solar roof. Every month, the solar panels generate about 1,000 kilowatt hours of electricity, enough to cover almost all the energy needs of an average landed property. But Mr. England actually needs less electricity than he produces and supplies the rest to the grid. Unlike most bills where you have just one number, I've got two. This is where I buy the electricity, this is where I sell it. So in the month of September, I bought 383 kilowatt hours and sold 617. There's the buying, $99. There's the selling, minus 129. And that gives me a net negative electricity bill. But experts say many barriers still remain. For example, larger energy producers are still unable to sell their green electricity as a regulatory framework doesn't yet exist. That's one of the problems we face today. So now if these people basically uh, you know, can re get a return on their investment by um, putting solar systems on their factories, let's say, or plants, and uh, you know, use it when uh, the need arises, but when they have excess, they should be able to put back into the grid and you know, get some uh, revenue from it so that the payback is a lot faster and better. Apart from solar, another key energy source labelled as high potential is biomass, which has taken off in other parts of Asia. 
In Singapore, this means burning plant-based material like discarded tree branches and wood chips. Another small but growing sector is biogas, which involves the fermenting of organic material like food waste and chicken manure to produce fuel. Two new plants are scheduled to open in Singapore in 2014 and will be among the first few factories in Asia which convert chicken manure into fuel. At Chu's egg farm, the 60 tons of droppings collected a day will be able to supply up to 70% of the farm's energy needs. These are definitely good solutions. Again, they'll be constrained because of our limited use and I mean, there is so much you can recycle, right? I mean, you can't keep on recycling. Though biogas and biomass make up only 0.8% of our energy mix today, experts say this should change, especially if the government puts new policies and measures in place. For example, this could include setting up a system to collect and segregate food waste. Fast forward to 2020. This is how Singapore's energy mix should look like, according to the Sustainable Energy Association of Singapore. Most of our energy generated still comes from fossil fuels, but the proportion from renewables has doubled, driven mainly by solar energy and the remainder from biogas and biomass. But what about the energy landscape beyond 2020? Could we see other forms of energy that have not yet caught on? In Sentosa, scientists from NTU are testing out tidal turbines. For now, they can only generate enough energy to power 70 light bulbs per month but we could see larger turbines in the future. Part of uh, Arian's uh, own R&D roadmap would be to look at in three to five years deploying uh, larger turbines in the southern islands and see the feasibility and demonstrate that a tidal turbine can play a role in powering up uh, remote islands. There's also the possibility of nuclear power. But this is limited by the need for a 25 kilometer safety radius around a nuclear plant. I don't think you can have a plan in Singapore itself, but nothing stopping us from uh, looking at having a nuclear plant on, on an island in Indonesia or Malaysia, and then, you know, putting that power into the ASEAN grid. Singapore is estimated to need 50 terawatt hours of energy per year by 2025, up from 42.6 in 2012. Energy security has traditionally been high up on the government's agenda. But with the demand rising at such a significant rate, energy issues are likely to dominate national discussions for many years to come. And that's Singapore tonight. Bye-bye.